Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, almost a year ago, Oxfam International made a statement against the IMF loan program saying that the International Monetary Fund must abandon demands for austerity as it only worsens the situation of a particular nation than helping it. That analysis by Oxfam found that 13 out of the 15 IMF loan programs negotiated during the second year of the pandemic in 2021 require new austerity measures such as taxes on food and fuel or spending cuts that could put vital public services at risk. Sounds familiar, isn't it? Now, despite all these warnings, our empty-headed th uh, tanks or think tanks led by the Colombo Liberals have somehow got the government to believe that IMF is God. I mean, I have had ministers sitting next to me in my programs denouncing the IMF, which they are now worshipping. And not stopping there, they're asking us to do the same. Now, what is the government thinking? Will we get the IMF bailout or not by tomorrow? He is the State Minister of Finance. We are very confident that we will receive the program approvals. And also, I think going further, the program approval is very vital for us. Uh, the president, the government of Sri Lanka, all government officials as well as people in Sri Lanka have worked hard towards uh, obtaining approvals. The reforms what we were doing are not the most easiest reforms to do as well as to absorb at a critical time like this. But I think all the reforms what we have done has uh, stabilized the economy that, and there is a very positive uh, sentiment uh, going on around the world that Sri Lanka is back in track and also that Sri Lanka has put the house in order. So basically once uh, receiving approval, the entire world will uh, get the message that Sri Lanka has put the house in order. I think that this level of confidence is very important for us to going forward because uh, one, it is not only the $2.9 billion which we receive uh, from uh, the IMF over a 48-month period, but we have to go beyond that. But we are very confident with all the negotiations what we have done and uh, with the acceptance of our transparency, our determination and the commitment the president and the government has shown, we are very confident that within this uh, time frame, we will receive uh, in excess of 7 billion US dollars from all the agencies that are supporting us as well as multilateral and bilateral uh, uh, friends. Well, that was the State Minister of Finance, uh, Shehan Semasinga, speaking to us uh, exclusively. Well, joining me now is Professor of Political and International Affairs at Princeton University, Professor James Reeland. He joins me from New Jersey in the USA uh, via Zoom. He's also the author of the book, The IMF and Economic Development. Professor, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Now, you have studied why I, what IMF reforms are capable of doing to a nation. Now, if you had to put it into a nutshell, what have you observed and what has changed with time? Well, first, Mahish, I just want to thank you for inviting me onto your program. Uh, it's an honor. And I wish I could tell you that the main conclusions of my book have changed. Uh, I published it 20 years ago. And the main conclusion is that IMF programs hurt economic growth and exacerbate income inequality thus doubly hurting those worst off in society, labor and the poor. Now, when it comes to the finding on economic growth, I would say that there have been some studies that challenge the, my findings. And perhaps that's because the IMF has changed over time. I think there are cases where economic growth isn't hurt and maybe even can be helped. Even though I think in most cases still, IMF programs tend to be contractionary, and especially if a country is not economically important to the United States, the largest shareholder of the IMF, then economic growth can still be hurt. But when it comes to income inequality, there really are no studies that disagree with my original finding. Uh, there have been some very recent studies by some excellent scholars in Europe um, who have reached the same conclusion using different methodologies and different measures. And the bottom line is that 
the distribution of the effective IMF programs is not equal, and it does tend to hurt the poor. Indeed, uh, absolutely. Uh, Professor, now Sri Lanka's government has decided to go uh, with the IMF as the sole saviour of this nation. Now, by tomorrow, we will get to know whether God has answered our prayers. But the people can witness almost immediately that the pain these reforms are causing which is way too severe. Is there any advantage, according to you, your opinion, Professor, for a developing country like ours that can be gained by going to the IMF? So for many years, the answer has been no. Uh, there really hasn't been much competition to the IMF. Uh, when it comes to the World Bank and development programs, there are other uh, options. But when a country is in dire straits like Sri, Sri Lanka is right now, um, there really traditionally has only been one major international institution that can bail them out. I think that's still true in terms of international institutions. The BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa have a new development bank that countries are not really using. Uh, there's the Chiang Mai initiative, um, but the Chiang Mai initiative where Japan and China are the leaders um, re actually requires an IMF program to be in good standing. So when it comes to international multilateral efforts, the IMF is really the only game in town. That said, there are bilateral lenders. And of course, the big one is China. Um, and China does offer a different approach, um, perhaps less austerity, um, at least these days. I'm not sure that's going to last. Um, I'm not sure that necessarily going to China would be the right answer, but knowing that China is an option might give some leverage to the government for a stronger negotiation posture with the IMF. That said, I do think that the IMF goes in with some good intentions. One big change we've seen over the years is that the IMF now always discusses the poor and talks about the importance of maintaining a social safety net. The fact that we don't see a change in the economic impact on the poor suggests that that might just be talk or perhaps country's own governments, your own government, isn't doing enough to implement the, the, the social protections for the poor. Makes a lot of sense, uh, Professor. I also want to get your take on some uh, geopolitical issues. There seems to be a cold war brewing between, the, between China and the United States. Sri Lanka has become ground zero, Professor, for this cold war. How do you see this cold war playing out? Will this escalate into something of a world war status? Well, I obviously, I certainly hope not. And uh, wars, fortunately, do tend to be rare, especially amongst large powers. So I wouldn't predict that. Um, but that doesn't give much solace to a country like Sri Lanka, uh, countries like Nepal, countries that are really in the crossroads between uh, China and the West. Um, I do think that the competition is going to continue to heat up. I think that the recent pandemic uh, kind of has hurt the economic ties across these countries, economic ties that have uh, encouraged um, countries to seek peace. I do still think that we have one advantage because of the global integration of markets. During the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, we used to talk about mutually assured destruction, which was bleak, but perhaps a safety that neither side would start the war because we would destroy each other. That's still there with the United States and China, but we have an added protection of mutually assured economic destruction. And the fact that economies ar around the world are so tied, hopefully there are interest groups within every country that will lobby their governments to maintain some modicum of peace so that those economic transactions can continue because we really do depend on each other for survival. Indeed, uh, thank you. That was a Professor of Political and International Affairs at Princeton University, Professor James Breland, all the way from New Jersey. Let's take a short commercial break. And upon our return, we will uh, tell you what Victoria Newland, possibly the most dangerous woman on the planet, is up to. This is the State of the Nation, back in a moment.